Hi, I'm Tamara Keith, and I'd like to share with you some of the things I've learned about our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, and his taste in music. Right now, we're going to talk about political songs. Now, you've all probably heard political ads like these. He's practicing the politics of the past. His campaign manager lobbies for corporations outsourcing American jobs. The campaign chairman he picked last year, a bank lobbyist. Celebrity? Yes. Ready to lead? No. The last eight years haven't worked very well, have they? I'll make the next four better. But what about something like this? Hurrah for the choice of the nation, our chieftain so brave and so true. Then go for the great reformation, for Lincoln and Liberty too. You could say this is a political ad too, 1860 style. The song is called Lincoln and Liberty, and it was written for Lincoln by a man named Jesse Hutchison. Musician and folklorist Chris Valillo picks up the story from here. Now, Hutchison was the leader of a, a group called the Hutchison Family Singers. They were the most popular group of the age. Kind of like the Jonas Brothers. They did a very common thing. They, uh, they wrote this as a political song because they were ardent abolitionists and great supporters of Lincoln. They took an old Irish folk song called Ras and the Bow, and then they wrote new lyrics to it. The Hutchison family singers were abolitionists, meaning they wanted the slaves to be freed. And that was one of the biggest issues of the time. The country was divided over slavery and would soon head into the Civil War. But a song with an interesting past and new lyrics became a factor in the presidential campaign. Doug Jimerson is a musicologist who specializes in the music of the Civil War. Old Ross and the Bow was the most popular tavern song in early America. It was a drinking song. Yes, a drinking song. But hey, the Star-Spangled Banner, the national anthem, has a similar history. In part, we can, we can attribute uh, Lincoln's uh, successful election in 1860 to uh, Old Ross and the Bow and the words of Lincoln and Liberty. Uh, Lincoln himself claims that that song helped him win the White House. Again, Chris Valillo. Uh, it was so popular and so universally known that it just helped to spread his name, you know, that much farther. Um, and if you think about it, we're still doing it today. Uh, look at the song, you know, Yes We Can, that uh, Will I Am did for Barack Obama and the impact that that song had. It was a creed written into the founding documents that declared the destiny of the nation. Yes, we can. It's the exact same process, it's just translated to a different era. Not long after Lincoln took office in March 1861, the Civil War began. The war would dominate Lincoln's presidency, and as the war dragged on, Valillo says the popular music of the era reflected the conflict. And those were some of his favorite songs, you know, like a Songs like The Battle Cry of Freedom, or one which I think is so touching, um, We Are Coming, Father Abraham. We are coming, Father Abram, 600,000 more. From Mississippi's winding streams and from New England's shore. Valillo says the song was written as a direct response to Lincoln's call in July 1862 for 300,000 additional men to volunteer for the war effort. It spoke about Lincoln the man as opposed to, you know, Lincoln the politician. You know, they refer to him as Father Abram. And one, one story tells that the day before Lincoln gave the Gettysburg Address, the Union soldiers in Gettysburg gathered under his window at the hotel and serenaded him with that song. If you look across our the song We Are Coming, Father Abram, first appeared as a poem on the front page of the New York Evening Post on July the 19th, 1862, just a couple of weeks after Lincoln had first made his call. Uh, the words were written by an economist named James S. Gibbons, who was inspired by Lincoln's call to arms. The poem just swept the nation. Uh, by August the 7th, when it was published in Washington, D.C., they had already set the words to music, and it was being sold in sheet form. Ultimately, the song would sell over two million copies. Now, in an era when selling 3,000 copies of a song was considered a great success, this was unheard of.
This is Tamara Keith for Arts Edge, a program of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. For more on Lincoln and music, visit us on iTunes or our website at www.artsedge. That's A-R-T-S-E-D-G-E dot Kennedy dash center dot org. O-R-G.